Uh, I was talking on Monday about that first trajectory of Last Supper. Uh, last Supper, and what is flushing like that? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, last Supper, Eucharist, uh, Passion of Christ, Easter, right? That was that, that was that trajectory that we're on. And the point was that when the Christi Christi and Christians work out a celebration of Easter, right, there is a profound memory still of the Paschal Lamb. There is a memory of the Paschal Feast still lurking behind Christian uh, celebration of Easter. And for that, I brought you that wonderful prayer from the Book of, Book of Common Prayer. That's what we did last time. I didn't say the obvious was that just as in the rabbinic Seder, we imagine ourselves being redeemed from Egypt, Right, that uh, we have a vicarious exodus. Our ancestors were redeemed from Egypt. We are redeemed from slavery. What slavery are we redeemed from? Metaphorical, real, not very clear. But just as we participate in their redemption, similarly for Christians. Right, that the this is a, a vicarious kind of kind of redemption. Um, the redemption from Egypt prefigures past redem prefi is past event prefigures future redemptions. The uh, death of Christ is redemption from sin, for himself, for all humanity, for me. Okay, so we have that same sort of dynamic at work. Okay, now we're looking at trajectory number two. Trajectory number two, which gets us from Last <coughs> Supper, uh, from the Paschal Lamb, uh, Last Supper, <coughs> celebration of the Passover, with the words of institution, this is my blood, blood this is my body, uh, and we move forward into the Eucharist, right? The formation of the Christian liturgy of the Eucharist. Here, if I understand Christian trajectory correctly, <laughs> here, interestingly enough, the Passover connection is forgotten, right? The Eucharist is taken out of its Passover connection, so Easter retains its Passover connection, but the Eucharist does not. Right? And it disassociates itself from Passover in two ways in the course of Christian history, where it becomes something independent, something freestanding. One is as disassociated from the festival of Easter-Passover. It becomes a ritual that can be observed at any point. Right? That already begins with Paul, who referring to the words of institution at the Last Supper, Right, Paul does not mention the obvious fact that it happens at the Paschal Lamb, at the Paschal Meal. It's independent. It just seems to be floating chronologically. Later in Christianity, in Christian history, we will see, we won't see in this course, we'll see elsewhere, sorry. Uh, later in Christian history, some Christian groups will retain uh, baptism <coughs> and Eucharist as particularly fitting rituals for Easter. The once a year will be the occasion for these things. But as Christianity goes on, the notion the, the Eucharist or the communion is celebrated all the time. Uh, in fact, nowadays it's quite common. Every Sunday you can go to a church and partake of communion. There have been debates within Christian groups about how often, when, where communion should be celebrated. But the link with Easter uh, is broken, right, and becomes just a freestanding ritual. Similarly, in the words of institution in the Gospels, Jesus is having a meal with his disciples. So the original Eucharist in the Gospel text is not just associated with Passover, it's associated with the Passover meal. And in, in Christian liturgy, Christian history, uh, with the link with Passover is broken, and also the link with the meal. It becomes a freestanding ritual wherein the food, the blood, and the blood, wine, bread, body, right, becomes symbolic food. It's not part of an actual formal meal. Uh, there's some evidence that um, perhaps early on this was celebrated in the context of meals, and Christians do have liturgical meals, which are usually called agape feasts, right, which seem to have some sort of independent existence, uh, because by the time you get to our friend Justin Martyr, and that's in your lecture handout, this is a paragraph I quote from <coughs> the, the Justin's Apology, not the Dialogue with Trifo, you will not find this paragraph in Dialogue with Trifo, You'll find it in another book that Justin wrote, the uh, First Apology, uh, which is fine, but it's giving you the reference and the passage you can look at, in which we see already it's a freestanding liturgical act. The communion has nothing to do with Passover, nothing to do with the meal, it's something done on a Sunday as a freestanding <coughs> liturgical act. 
So here, Christian, Christian history took the Eucharist out of its Paschal context <coughs> and developed it into a central ritual in the life of the church. Okay. Um, last big point on that, and then we can get on to Melito of Sardis. What do we Christians do when we partake of the body and blood of Christ? Well, we participate. Christ becomes in us. And at some level, we are united with Christ in such a way so that just as Christ died and was resurrected, similarly, we die and are resurrected. In other words, we Christians triumph over death. Or another way to put it, we Christians triumph over sin because death is caused by sin. So by triumphing over death, we are triumphing over sin, partaking in the life of death of Christ. In that sense, the Eucharist is just like the Passover Seder again. It is transformative. It is vicarious. We are part participating in somebody else's experience and claiming it as our own. Either our Israelite ancestor is leaving Egypt or Christ. Right? We become one with them, and they become one with us. This is very clear in the Eucharistic Liturgy. Is that up on the page, Eucharistic Liturgy? No. Eucharistic okay. Liturgy. This is also from the Book of Common Prayer. I don't know the prehistory of this uh, prayer, but uh, I'm assuming, again, it is a traditional prayer. Beloved in the Lord, that's vocative. We're addressing the community. Our Savior Christ, the night before he suffered, suffered, how do you say suffer? That's Pascha in Greek, Paschein in Greek, right? Passion, right? That's the suffering of Christ, the passion of Christ. The night before he suffered, instituted the sacrament. Can't talk about that word, that's a complicated word, but some other time. Instituted the sacrament of his body and blood as a sign and pledge of his love for the continual remembrance of the sacrifice of his death. Remembrance, that phrase is in Luke and in Paul, you remember? For the sacrifice of his death and for spiritual sharing in his risen life. For in these holy mysteries we are made one with Christ and Christ with us. We are made one body in him and members one of another. That's why it's also called communion. Right? Through the ritual act of the Eucharist, we become common, we become joined. We with all Christians one to another in the community and we Christians with Christ. So it's transformative in a way which is eerily similar to the way the Seder is transformative. What does that mean, you ask? Don't know, but I know it's interesting. In other words, it's very hard to figure out who got what from whom, or they both have a common ritual <coughs> reflex here at work, where many rituals have as their point the intention of transforming the observer. This you do in Religion 101. Talk about theory of ritual. So both the Seder and the Christian rituals, each of, of Easter and of uh, the Eucharist, are all transformative in one way or another, in which the observer is transformed from your my mundane self, from my body, into something else or someone else. <clears throat> okay, that's the end of that trajectory. That's the end of my Monday lecture. Any questions on Monday? All right, we seem docile today again. All right, hopefully we'll wake up. Okay, I'm ready to get now to lecture number two for this week, which is the <coughs> talk about one particular text, which is an absolutely amazing text. Um, and again, it highlights some of these key issues between Judaism and Christianity, between Jews and Christians on Passover, Christ, and, and so on. Our hero is Melito of Sardis, right? Somebody who I suspect you never heard of. Oh, yes, can you? It's also on the, click on the W, it'll on the word. Um, Melito of Sardis, someone who I suspect you never heard of either until you took this course, but that's all right. You know, like Justin Martyr, these people are significant figures in the history of Christianity, even if they're not household names, right? What, what can I do? Okay, Melito Sardis, so you have a little biographical <coughs> info up there on the screen. We don't know very much, we're, so we're around 180 CE, 
right? We are uh, the generation or so after Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr, we think, is around 160. Zamolito would be approximately a generation later, giving a lot of wiggle room because it's that chronology we don't have. Where is Sardis? I was going to do a Google Earth thing for Sardis. I just couldn't get around to it. Google, yeah. So Sardis is in western Turkey. Okay, it's, a, it's an important city in western Turkey. You take one of those tours when you retire in your golden years, you'll all go to Sardis, Aphrodisias, Ephesus. These are the big sites that you want to see in western Turkey. They have spectacular archaeological remains. Okay, including a spectacular synagogue that was found in Sardis. But I digress. So back to Melito is from Sardis, a, an important town in western Asia Minor. He is important for our purposes because uh, transmitted under his name is an amazing text called Peri Pascha, On the Pasch. This text was only discovered in 1940, so it wasn't that long ago that this text was literally dug up out of the sands of Egypt and then reconstructed by, by scholars. Uh, but it is an amazing text, and it is, all scholars agree, the best exemplar of quarto decimanism. Quarto deciman. He was a quarto deciman. What is a quarto deciman? Someone who likes 14, give that girl a star. Yeah, exactly, right, very good, yes. Someone, right, so a quarto decimal is a 14th, right? Quarto, of course, is four, and decimal, like decimal, is 10. So a quarto decimal is a 14th. What does that mean? A quarto decimal is one of the uh, numerous Christian variants about how to calculate Easter. Right? Uh, this was a vigorous debate in the early church about how to calculate Easter, and even to this very day. Orthodox Eastern Christians and Western uh, Catholic Protestant Christians don't agree on the calculation of Easter. On any given year, Easter may or may not be the same Sunday, depending upon whether you're in the Eastern Church or the Western Church. So, uh, in the antiquity, there are even more uh, numerous debates among Christians how to, when to calculate the celebration of Easter. So the 14thers have a, are called that because they're celebrating, what's 14 class? Remind me, 14, 14, we've seen that number many times in the last 10 days. What's 14? 14th day of the first month, Nisan is the <coughs> Passover, slaughter of the Paschal Lamb. So the 14thers are ones who are saying we observe Pascha we observe Pascha on the 14th of the first spring month. In other words, when the Jews are doing it. This is one of the main objections against the 14th years. You're just like Jews. You're celebrating the fourth Easter on the Pascha on the 14th. We're Christians, remember? So we don't want to do it with the Jews. That's one of the arguments against the 14th years which may explain some of the anti-Jewish rhetoric in Melito that we're coming to in a second, eager to prove that we're not Jews. Okay, but we'll come to that in a second. The key point then is for 14 thirds, Easter is not always on Sunday, because the 14th is the 14th, whatever it was, for historical reasons, we celebrate it on the 14th, whatever day of the week it happens to be. It could be on a Sunday, but you don't know. And Next key point, for the 14th, there is like Melito, Easter, or Pascha, is primarily a celebration of Christ's passion. Because Pascha, again, is the Greek word from Paschen, which means to suffer. So we are liturgically marking Christ's passion. Whereas for the rest of the church, when we celebrate Easter, what are we celebrating? Resurrection. Christ's resurrection. Now, there's not a contradiction here, because obviously the passion leads to the resurrection, but the, there is a tension liturgically, right? How we, in our liturgy. What does liturgy mean? Mode of worship. Mode of worship, right. Our formal worship, our patterns of worship, right. In our prayers, in our songs, in our hymns, what are we celebrating? What are we marking? In the church, in the, uh, what will become the great church, we celebrate on Easter the resurrection of Christ, which happened on Sunday. That's why Easter is on Sunday. In the, for the 14thers, as in this text, Peri Pascha, we are primarily interested in Christ's suffering. Just like that movie of a few years ago, right? The Passion of the Christ. It's all about Christ's suffering. More whipping, more blood, 
Right, that's what you saw in the movie. Right, so here's what we got that here uh, in the text. We're celebrating Christ's suffering. Why do we celebrate Christ's suffering, class, to anticipate? Christ suffers and therefore... We don't have to. Therefore we don't have to. Or I put it differently, the greater is Christ's suffering is the greater is the atoning power of his sacrifice. So it's not so, therefore it is Easter, but it's not exactly Easter, right? It's a certain different kind of Easter. So uh, this, as far as we can tell, our Melito is one of these quarto decimeners, quarto decimens, even though the word does not appear anywhere in the extant fragments. Uh, this is our modern scholarly interpretation of what's going on based upon various clues, which again, don't need to concern us here. But this is a representative of a different kind of Christianity from what you are used to, both in terms of chronology and in terms of liturgical focus. Okay, general questions on this. Now we can look at some specific passages and features of Melito of Sardis. No, okay. Uh, I'll take that as everybody's in agreement with me. Okay, major theme as opposed to as you're all asleep, which is the alternative. So uh, I won't do that. <coughs> so, uh, Melito of Sardis, major themes of Melito of Sardis, Peri Pasca. Uh, I uploaded the text for you, by the way, to the co uh, course page under readings. So if you don't want to click all the way to that excite source, you can stay right here on the Harvard website if you feel more comfortable. Okay, Jesus is the Paschal sacrifice. Jesus is the, Christ is the Paschal Lamb. Where that motif we've already seen. That comes from John. Gospel of John, most famously. Yes, Christ is the Paschal Lamb. Right? The day the 14th is the day on which Christ is slaughtered. Because that's the day on which the Paschal Lamb is slaughtered. Okay, we've seen that already, yes? You all knew that, right? I worry sometimes. Okay, so um, Justin has the same idea too. I gave you a reference to it in the last lecture notes. Uh, I didn't talk about it, but Justin has even a more remarkable text, which is to say that the Paschal lamb put on a spit. Uh, after the lamb is slaughtered, the carcass is put on a spit and then roasted whole, right? Justin says that the image of the Paschal lamb on the spit looks like Christ on a cross. Uh, this strains my imagination, I admit, uh, but anyway, I read an article of people some of them full of diagrams trying to figure out how a human being on a cross looks like a lamb on a spit. Anyway, maybe it's meant to be metaphorical. Anyway, for <laughs> Justin, he says the one evokes the other, or again, it's a type. Right, we'll see that in one second. Right, it's a type. The slaughtered <laughs> lamb, Paschal lamb, is a type for, paradigm of, model of, archetype for, Christ on the cross. That is what you have throughout this whole text, from one end to the, uh, to the other. And here's a wonderful passage here from paragraph 103. I am your forgiveness, I am the Pascha of salvation, I am the lamb slaughtered for you, I am your ransom, I am your life, I am your resurrection, I am your light, I am your salvation, I am your king. There's a certain flavor to this uh, style, that either you like it, I do, uh, or you find it really obnoxious and unbelievably repetitive and unbelievably annoying, but that's just a matter of taste. Okay, that's the main point. Next point, Exodus 12. The Peri Pascha, as we have it, seems to be fundamentally an extended meditation, Christian meditation on Exodus 12. The same paragraph that I asked you to read for last week, that's the same paragraph Melito is reading as a Christian. And as a Christian, Melito is taking Exodus 12 as his departure point. And when we Christians read Exodus 12, what do we see? Answer, we see Christ. That's what we see. So Exodus 12 is the uh, focal point of the, of the narrative, and he tells you specifically his theory of typology in some remarkable paragraphs, which I'm, I'm going to, uh, well, I'll read one or two brief excerpts here, which I gave you on your handout, right, in which he uses the word. This is all a type, he says for a typology. Remember we discussed this word weeks ago already. So, so he says the text talks about the slaughtering of the lamb, but we know that it means or it's fulfilled or is a model or is an archetype, is a forerunner for what's going to come later, which is the slaughter of Christ the lamb. So here we have a few uh, passages which I excerpted for you. So in paragraph four, 
uh, uh, stanza 44. At one time, the slaughter of sheep was valuable. Now it is without value because of the life of the Lord. The death of sheep was once valuable. Now it is without value because of the salvation of the Lord. The blood was once without value. Now it is the salvation of the Lord of the Lord. The silent land, the temple, Jerusalem, right? All these things have been fulfilled and thereby, Melito suggests, canceled or exhausted or I don't know what image to use. Sort of like the battery. You know, the battery's run out. It once had power. Now it has no power because it's been exhausted or all his energy has been transferred to Christ. Okay, uh, some of the most interesting lines in Melito are Christ, God, Son, and Lamb. We'll be talking in the next couple of weeks. Today is our last session on rituals. Starting next week, we'll be doing theology uh, between uh, Jews and Christians debating theology based on scripture. All right. so one of the most contentious issues in the history of Christianity, of course, is how we understand the relationship between God, the Father, God to Christ. Father, Son, or, was that the right metaphor? We have a metaphor, God and Lord. One person, two persons, three persons. Okay, this is one of the most contentious issues in the history of Christianity. Uh, Melito is living before those what are called our Christological controversies, which erupt primarily with great ferocity in the fourth century. He's living in the second. So he can use all kinds of language, images, and metaphors and not worry whether or not he is particularly hewing to the right official party line about how to understand the relationship between Christ and God. So he's got a series of uh, re really remarkable uh, passages. So he says, Christ is all things. Christ is the Father, Christ is the Son, Christ is the Logos, as we'll discuss next, time, next week or the week after. Logos is the power of reason, the power of speech or one might say the mind of God, capital M, is the, lo is the Logos. Often mistranslated word, it does not mean word, it means speech, reason. So Christ is the, is the Father, Christ is the Son, Christ is the Logos, Christ is the Lamb, Christ is God, Christ is man, right? And if you object, how can Christ be all these things at the same time? Well, that's because I'm not a systematic theologian. I don't have to worry about it, Melito would say in reply. So Christ is man, etc., etc. Christ is present on the Lord. It is paragraph, stanza 66. Is that the next page? Is that still up there? Stanza 66, where we have the most remarkable uh, imagery. God put on a suffering one and comes forth a man. So there is God, and God puts on Jesus as if Jesus were a garment or a cloak and thereby God becomes human in order to suffer on the cross. This is, a, this is a standard theological dilemma. If Christ is God, then why is Christ suffering? Isn't suffering a sign of humanity? How does God suffer? Well, okay, this is a standard problem in Christian theology uh, that where the official answer as it emerges from the great church is Christ is both fully God and fully human at the same time. Okay, we'll discuss this. That's uh, very deep waters. We'll discuss this. Anyway, so here is stanza 66. God put on a suffering one and comes forth a man. This is the one who came from heaven to earth for the sake of the one who suffers. I don't understand how to parse exactly the relationship between God and Father and God and Son in this paragraph. Melito is using this imagery of putting on a garment, and I'm not sure what to do with it exactly. And has clothed himself with that very one through the womb of a virgin, having come forth as human, accepted the sufferings of the sufferer through his body, which is capable of suffering. And he destroyed those human sufferings by a spirit which was incapable of dying. He killed death, which had put man to death. Hmm. Love it. Uh, not sure exactly what this means in theological terms, but liturgically, this is powerful stuff, right? In which he uh, relishes the paradox. Uh, he plays with the paradox. God, man, death, uh, you know, death thou shall die, that sort of thing. Right. So, uh, anyway, I just put, observe for the moment, paragraph 66, that, that uh, middle participle in Greek, right? This is the one who came, uh, or has come. In Greek, it's afikomenos, which sure sounds like a word we discussed last week. Afikomen. Hmm. Afikomenos is not a technical Greek word, it's just a regular old Greek middle simple participle from afiknestai. But nonetheless, 
there's that word, and sure looks, resonates, sounds like something else. Don't know what to do with that. Hopefully I'll come back to that at the end. Okay, now we get to the, uh, to be honest, the ugly part. So, let's think about the logic of it. Christ is the Paschal Lamb. Who slaughters the Paschal Lamb class? Israelites. Israelites. It's a command from Exodus. Who slaughtered Christ the Paschal Lamb? That's right. The logic is inescapable. It's the Jews, or Israel speaking theologically, Jews speaking uh, contemptuously. Right? Uh, they are responsible for the slaughter of the Paschal, of the Paschal Lamb. Again, Melito, like Justin, conveniently omits the Romans. Right? You would never know that there are Romans in charge of Roman Palestina. You would never know that uh, Pontius Pilate is the governor, and that nothing happens without the official consent of the Romans, and that is Roman soldiers who do the deed. You would never know that from Melito, because Melito is not a lecture in history. Melito is a statement of Christian theology. And he, for Melito, as for Justin, there's absolutely no hesitation or any doubt about who bears moral responsibility. And the answer, of course, is the Jews. And here we have a particularly remarkable set of paragraphs in paragraph 74 through 77, where he argues that Israel, on the one hand, is doing what it was necessary to do. On the other hand, Israel bears moral responsibility. This is a well-known uh, conundrum. Witty Jew replies to Christian, well, yeah, we killed Christ, but isn't that what you wanted? How would you atone for your sins if nobody killed Christ? You need Christ to suffer and die. That's how you bring a atonement into the world. Without that, there would be no atonement. So you should be thankful. So why are you angry at me for killing Christ? I'm doing what had to happen according to your own theology. That's what the witty Jew says to the Christian. This is not a new argument, right? This is an argument Melito is aware of, and so is Justin in one paragraph. If you look at the end of this paragraph, same argument in Justin Dialogue 95. Go look it up. It's the same argument. So here is Melito's response to that argument. Why, O Israel, did you do this strange injustice? You dishonored the one who honored you. You held in contempt the one who held you in esteem. You denied the one who publicly acknowledged you, blah, 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 blah. As ever, if you have effort, that shit has right. Nevertheless, Israel admits, paragraph 74, I killed the Lord. Why? because it was necessary for him to die. As you Christians themselves, yourselves say, necessary for him to die. That's why we killed him. You have deceived yourself, O Israel, rationalizing thus about the death of the Lord. It was necessary for him to suffer, yes, but not by you. Necessary for him to be dishonored, but not by you. Necessary for him to be judged, but not by you. Necessary for him to be crucified, but not by you, nor by your right hand. O Israel, you ought to have cried aloud to God with his voice, O oh Lord, if it is necessary for your son to suffer, and this be your will, let him suffer indeed, but not at my hands. <coughs> let him be judged by the uncircumcised. Let him be crucified by the tyrannical right hand, not by mine. In other words, Israel should have said, Jesus, why don't you go to Norway? <laughs> and let the Norwegians crucify him. But Israel did not say that. Israel said, We'll do it. <laughs> and that's why Israel, Jews, bear the moral blame. By the way, Jews is not the language of Melito. He's always thinking biblically, so it's Israel. All right, Israel bears the blame for the crucifixion because of their willingness to accept moral responsibility for the act. Now, there's a long and complicated theological history behind this about from the Hebrew Bible about uh, how God uses foreign nations in order to persecute Israel. So God uses the Babylonians to destroy the temple. But then what's God going to do? He's going to turn around and destroy the Babylonians. God's going to use the Assyrians to punish the Israelites. What does he do after the Assyrians punish the Israelites? He punishes the Assyrians. And if you object to some illogic to this, well, yeah, there is some logic to this, but there's a long history of this kind of speculation about how God uses a people, or how people play a role in a script written out by God controlling human events. So here Israel is scripted. Israel is doing what it needs to do. Israel kills Christ.
but nonetheless, somehow it bears more responsibility for the deed, which is what Melito is talking about. Melito then reaches the next logical conclusion. Israel has slaughtered this Paschal lamb. Israel has slaughtered Christ. Christ is God. Christ is Son of God. Christ is Lord. Therefore, Israel has slaughtered God. That idea appears here for the first time in the history of, history of Christendom, the charge of deicide, that Israel has slaughtered God. And if you object, how is this logically possible? If it's God, how can you slaughter God? Well, once again, logic is not the right uh, line of inquiry here, not the right mode of analysis. This is liturgy, this is theology, this is poetry. So Melito has been called the poet of deicide. The one who hung the earth in space is himself hanged. Hanged is another way of saying crucified. The one who fixed heavenly places hell from hell. The one who firmly fixed all things firmly fixed on the tree. The Lord is insulted. God has been murdered. The king of Israel has been destroyed by the right hand of God. Now, of course, when you use this kind of language in the uh, early 21st century, one cannot forget right, the events of the 20th. So I want to make it very clear, I am not suggesting that Melito wants to pack up Jews in boxcars and send them to Auschwitz. But I am suggesting what Melito is saying, of course, is that with the arrival of Christ, with the advent of Christianity, with the atoning power of Christ, Judaism is dead. Judaism no longer has any theological meaning or theological purpose. God has re Israel has rejected Christ. God has rejected Israel. That's, I would argue, is what Melito's point is. For all I know, he was very nice and friendly to Jews he met on the street in Sardis. Right, but for him, this is all a theological argument. This is on the realm of theology, not on the realm of sociology. In the realm of theology, Israel lies dead because Israel has rejected God, God has rejected Israel, and consequently, Israel has now been emptied of all theological value. Which is what we saw earlier about his typology in Exodus, reading of Exodus 12. The Paschal Lamb is fulfilled, it's over, it's done, nothing left. That's how I would read Melito of Sardis. And if you say, well, Shai, you're just trying to be ecumenical and as politically correct as you can with an extraordinarily difficult text, well, maybe. Maybe. But I would argue that's the plain implication of what Melito is doing, and it should not be read in the light of the Holocaust. But on this point, I admit, let people decide as they wish. If you're interested in this, in this point, you can read a book written by my cousin, Jeremy Cohen, he's my cousin, not through his father, Cohen, but through his mother, uh, his mother, Naomi Wiener Cohen, who is my second cousin, right, uh, has, a, has a, a book called Christ Killers, right, in which he gives a history of this motif of Jews as killers of Christ, there's a whole chapter on Melito, and he and I independently hit upon the same interpretation, but he published it first. So uh, this is uh, cousin Jeremy Cohen, if you're interested, on this motif. Okay, so, uh, Melito of Sardis, a very rich and interesting text. It's definitely something one can chew on. Okay, um, questions, objections, arguments? To say that we're swimming in deep waters class is an understatement, yes? Do you understand that, yes? Okay, next heading in the handout. A Christian Pascal Haggadah, question mark? One of the exciting things about this text of Melito when it was rediscovered in 1940, in published 1940, scholars immediately read it and said, this is clearly a liturgical text. It seems to be, its setting seems to be a group setting of some kind. What are these Christians doing reading and meditating on Exodus 12? Gee, I know another text that is focused on the reading and meditating Exodus 12. It's the Haggadah, it's the Rabbinic Seder. Maybe we have here in Melito something like a Christian Seder. And this text is the Christian Haggadah. 
And this idea already came out very quickly in the, early, in the 1940s and was developed in some articles in the 1960s. So, what is the argument that this is a Christian Haggadah for a Christian Seder? And if so, this is really interesting. We have pro and con. Pro and con. On the pro side, this appears to be a liturgical text. I already said that. We read Exodus 12. I already said that too. Next bullet point. We follow the Mishnahic prescription. Remember to begin with shame and end with honor. That's the trajectory of the story of Passover. From slavery to freedom. From shame to honor. Well, that's what Melito is doing. Exactly the same thing. He talks about from Adam's fall, from the arrival of sin, to Christ's death and atonement for sin. That's the trajectory of Melito's narrative. Well, that's the same trajectory. Paragraph 68 sounds like a passage from the Mishnah. This is the one who delivered us from slavery to freedom, darkness to light, death to life, tyranny to eternal kingdom, made us a new priesthood, a special people forever. It sounds just like the Mishnah. You brought us forth from bondage to freedom, sorrow to joy, morning to festivity, darkness to light, servitude to redemption. Gee, sure sounds like, well, I don't know who co copied what from whom, but they seem to be in the same, in the same rhetorical world here. Next, we have this paragraph that sound like an inverted Dayenu. We didn't talk about Dayenu because Dayenu is not in the Mishnah. And Dayenu is an undated and virtually undateable uh, prayer that wound up somewhere sneaking into the Haggadah. It is, if you ever go to Passover Seder, everybody loves Dayenu because all the kids can sing it. Die, die, yenu, die, die, yenu, die, die, yenu, die, yenu, die, yenu, die, yenu, die. So that's why everybody likes to sing it. That's why it's very popular. But interestingly, the logic of the prayer is a little odd, right? In which the redemption story from Egypt is broken down into different pieces. And each little piece, we say, God, that would have been enough. Had you stopped right here, that would have been enough. Logically, it makes no sense. What would have made good enough to split the Red Sea and bring us into the middle and then stop right there, right? That would not be very effective. So it, there's no logic to it. It's, it's liturgy. It's liturgy. It's saying that how great is the power of God and how great is that redemptive act. It's a series of miracles. Not one miracle. It's a series of miracles. Right? One act of redemptive, one power, act of redemptive power after another. Well, there's a paragraph in Melito which sounds just like an inverted Dayenu, where Dayenu, the Jews, are saying, it would have been enough for us. And Melito, uh, and Melito was saying precisely the opposite. Well, how about this? How about that? How about this? How about that? In which he has a similar kind of list. Okay, you can read it right here on the, on the handout. So there's a mysterious Dayenu connection. There's that other paragraph connection. We have the liturgical setting. And last but not least is that mysterious afikomenos, a word that appears twice in Melito to describe Christ. Christ is the one who has come, afikomenos. Boy, I wish I could get to the bottom of that to figure out what's going on here. Is this just casual coincidence? He's just using a regular old Greek middle, middle participle. Middle Greek is, is active in Greek. It's also passive in something called middle. So it's a middle participle. It's perfectly normal. It's just a regular old Greek word. You learn it in Greek 101. It's just a very, nothing fancy schmancy. And it just sounds like afi koma has nothing to do with it. Or maybe it does. Afi Komenos is the coming one. And that's what we Jews wait for at the end of the Seder, is the Redeemer, the one who is coming, but has not yet come. Ugh, I'm really confused. Anyway, so this is uh, titillating, I would say. Teasing. Maybe there's some connection here, or maybe not. That's the pro argument. Con argument. And I think the, con the negatives have it, in my mind. It's a liturgical text, yes. It's a, cell, it's a clearly designed focusing on scripture, focusing on the exodus of Egypt, focusing on the redemption story, prefiguring Christian redemption. That's all clear. Does that mean, therefore, it is a Christian Seder, and this is the Christian Haggadah text for a Christian Seder? I shy Cohen, I'm willing to say, no, because I don't see the smoking gun. Or in this case, I don't see the smoking bitter herbs. So there's no reference anywhere in the text to matzah, to bread, to wine, bitter herbs, except insofar as the, the Israelites themselves celebrated Passover. Exodus 12 mentions bitter herbs. But, but as far as when we're having bitter herbs, that's nowhere to be found. And surely, in a text like this, full of bitterness about the Israelites, I would have expected to see bitter herbs everywhere. No reference to the Eucharist. 
no reference to the words of institution of Christ at, at, uh, at the Last Supper. And indeed, there was no Last Supper. There's no reference to the Last Supper anywhere in the text. So I say, if this is a Christian liturgical text, it is an odd one indeed, which leaves out all the hallmarks of Christian liturgy. Therefore, I want to say it's not a Christian Seder, it's not a Christian Haggadah, it instead is a wonderfully rich passage of Christian meditation on Exodus 12, showing how Exodus 12, right, that most Jewish of passages full of ritual instructions of God to Moses to the Israelites, is at one and the same time a profoundly Christian passage, when read through the mirror, through the lenses of the suffering, death, resurrection of Christ which is what we see in Melita. So I want to say, in spite of those intriguing parallels, connections with uh, the Passover Haggadah and the Mishnah Psachim and that mysterious Api Komenos, I still don't think it adds up to a Christian Seder. But on this point too, let everyone decide, let each person decide what your sense of the text is as you read it. All right. We're going to do a Socrative quiz. I'm right on time, actually, two minutes early. Uh, so, sure, no, it's a question for two minutes. Uh, I a little filler there for two minutes. Uh, I can go back and read the passages. Uh, if you haven't read Melito yet, it's a little long, I admit. Uh, and also, you get the point pretty quickly, and he seems to be a repetitive. But again, it's, it's poetry, it's liturgy. You know, go with it, surrender yourself to it. It has power, even if by the time you get to the end, it's actually a shocking text. Okay, that's it. Oh, Brandon. Yeah, um, would you say that Melito is like, uh, he's more looking at the John's uh, version of... of uh, yes, as we already discussed, the John's theology of the, uh, of the Paschal Lamb triumphs. Every, everybody's got it. Okay. Right. Christ is the Paschal Lamb is such a powerful image that everybody's got it. Even if you also believe that Christ instituted the Eucharist at the Last Supper, which is illogical, but you put both together. Okay. Right. So Melito leaves out the words of institution, leaves out the Eucharist, leaves out the Last Supper. Okay. Right. Right. Sure. But, okay. okay. So he's working with John. Yes? Um, I understand, like, the, the idea that the Jews shouldn't have killed Christ, but like, let someone else do it. Right. But why is the slaughter of Christ, is it, is it a bad thing if it's compared to the Paschal sacrifice? Good. You put your finger on an, on an illogical moment. Right. Because the slaughter of the Paschal Lamb in Exodus 12 is commanded by God which is, I guess, a good thing, right, you know, in, in the scale of things. Whereas, excuse me, the slaughter of Jesus, of course, is a bad thing, right? It shows that uh, Jews, shows how wicked Jews are, or Israel, oh, I Israel is. So yes, there is a logic there. I'm not sure how to explain it. Uh, but if you, push, if you push it, right, he's, I mean, after all, the Gospel of John was not saying Christ at the Paschal Lamb in order to fix blame on the Israelites. That was not where John was going with this at all, right? But that's where Melito was going with it. So yeah, there is a certain disconnect there. I agree with you. If you have come up with a good answer to that, let me know. Yes. I have a question about the Afikoman thing. So yes. we talked about when we first talked about this. You said at first it meant the Afikoman was something Jews didn't do. Like it was. That's what the Mishnah says. We don't we don't end the Paschal meal with Afikoman. Yeah, and so in that sense, it was meant to mean like after dinner entertainment. Entertainment, drinks, food. Uh, yes, exactly. So do you like? Is it like? Believable that this was like this was probably written before Akikoman was interpreted as that hidden piece of money. Good point. Yeah, if I had time, I would pursue the matter. Right. So again, the, the Afi, idea that Afikoman is something that we await and ex look for expectantly at the end, yeah. namely a piece of matzah. Right. Mm -hmm. That of course is only found in the 13th, tested only in the 13th century and beyond. Yeah. So to make this this connection pregnant or really rich, you'd have to say was no, that idea of Afikoman is already old and it already was interpreted symbolically already back in ancient times, and uh, Melito and that is playing a riff on that, or the rabbis are playing a riff on this idea of the matzah of the end of days, uh, who will come at the end of the meal, will be fully revealed, and then come and redeem us. Right? You have to argue that you know, that series of associations is already around in antiquity. Now that's tough. You know, if you're a hard-blooded, hard-nosed historian, cold-blooded, hard-nosed historian, you, like me, you would say, "Well, you know, a thousand years is a long time. You know, I don't see until the 13th century in the text that comes from Rome. I don't know how you're going to get back to second, third century Asia Minor, Roman Palestine. I, I don't see it." However, other people will say, "No, surely it was there. Surely." But you're right, you put your finger on a problem. So maybe it is also all idle coincidence and we're making much out of nothing.
He's just talking Greek and he uses this word twice. All right, but yeah, that's good, good point. Yes, Harry? Is there a history of this um, liturgy of Melito actually being used? No. Until 1940, this text was not known. So his quarto decimens lost out. After all, the great church does not celebrate Easter on the 14th day of the spring month. It celebrates Easter on, you know, by its own calculations and on Sunday. And I guess the second question would be, um, if you're implying this connection between the apicomen of the Jews and the apicomen of the Christians, uh, and they're so similar, then who is taking from who? Whom? Yes, who is taking from whom? Excellent question. In the old days, scholars used to say all the time, Jews are always influencing, Christians are always receiving. In the last 20 years, the scholarly pendulum has swung. Now the tendency is to see all of rabbinic Judaism as somehow a reaction to, a response to, in fact, the borrowing from early Christianity. Or Christianity plays a formative role in the shaping of rabbinic Judaism. That's the trend for the last 20 years or so. Uh, I'm not sure which team I'm on in that one. I'm, I still have two minds on the subject. So you can argue the point either way. Two? Okay. Uh, and next week we start our survey of <coughs> Jewish and Christian theology.